Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and supporters of the Kata Hamburger Center for Advanced Study in the Humanities Law as Culture. As far as I see, we have people who do not speak German so well, so that we are obliged to speak in English, is that right? Or in uh, Italian or Hebrew or whatever. Uh, I think there is no choice, and for you it is no problem, and so far we can proceed like this. So I would like very much uh, to welcome you to the forum event with uh, Professor Dr. Thomas Dyer. You have seen how uh, the uh, lecture is entitled Regulating the Gaze, and he's not saying regulating the glance. This would give a completely different uh, 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 talk, I suppose, normative picture rules and visual images. And it is perhaps not completely by chance that I bought a book by Hans Bertin with me about Florence and Baghdad, uh, where uh, a westöstliche Geschichte des Blicks has been told to us because the gaze has very much to do how to construct an object, to make a picture by way of the gaze, and the picture is just a product of uh, the gaze. At least one has to discuss how different cultures conceive uh, the gaze and what the gaze means in the sociology of the senses of uh, Georg Zimmer, for example, uh, what makes the difference to the other senses and what is the specific character of the gaze uh, when the gazes are crossing, for example, but in pictures it is just the picture's eye that crosses us. The eye that sometimes is also called Das Auge des Gesetzes, the wonderful book by Michael Stolleis about the history of the metaphor that tells us how we are observed by the law. But your talk is about something else. So I have to present you. Uh, most of you know him much uh, better than he knows himself, but uh, I'm a scientist, big data, legal scholar, uh, obtained, uh, obtaining his doctorate degree in law from the LMU Munich, um, where you have also done at the same time under the four, aforementioned Hans Belting studies in art history. In 2000, you completed your habilitation uh, with a treatise on, and this really, you, one has to read loudly and clearly, Kompensation und Prävention Rechtsfolgen unerlaubter Handlungen in bürgerlichen Immaterialgüter und Wettbewerbsrecht. Das ist schon ein, that's an impressive title, but not only this, because you are dealing with uh, civil law, not under the compensation function only, but also the preventive role and, uh, of, of, of civil law. That is something that is much more landed, or seems to be landed for, from penal law, but in Recht der unerlaubten Handlung, there are good reasons for doing it, a cross-cutting of different spheres, inner spheres of the law. So since uh, 2999, you are Professor of Private Law and Legal Issues in the Information Society. That's a wonderful title of a professorship at the University of Karlsruhe. And simultaneously, Honorary Professor and Member of the Faculty of Law at the University of Freiburg. Uh, so there have been some guest professorships all also around the world, but then in 1914 you came to our Center for Advanced Studies uh, Law as Culture. 2014. 14, yes. I said, nine, nine, said 1914. So, yes, yes, but, but I'm, much more this, uh, I'm much more in this year uh, uh, because I lastly worked about the First World War and the uh, normative complex and the validity culture. Uh, when in uh, war times um, normative rules are impregnating a whole society uh, from fashion to penal uh, criminal law uh, and military law 
So that is why I made this mistake, mistake, excuse me, for that. So this double biographical and academic background fruitfully reunites two divergent discourses. Image theory that has become so important, what we call icon turn, and what are the <coughs> name, names for that, but where the image has become something we have brought into the debates uh, about cultural studies, and we must remember, in Weber, in Durkheim, there is no image debate as such, and perhaps something that is lacking in there, and where they have to be completed, and something that is very important. Once again, back to, uh, 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 pointing back to Belting, of course, in uh, the context of religious history, otherwise it is not understandable what the picture and what the image is about. Uh, so, what the real content and the problematic of the talk, uh, this night's talk is, I think he should explain himself better than me. It's, it's always embarrassing if somebody is saying what one has to say and there is nothing anymore to say in, in the end. Uh, no, and I won't pretend to can predict what you do, but the image is certainly not only those canvases we are used to, the image has become much uh, has become a much broader meaning if we go to the internet, if we go to a gig, a Google image uh, 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 window, for example, we know that we are in a completely different world than that in which uh, people could say that they knew perhaps uh, during their lives, their whole life, not more than 163 pictures or images. You brought the example, if I remember well. No, so it was somebody else. But there have been times when 200 pictures one had seen, images in one's life, uh, was uh, uh, an enormous uh, uh, amount of images. So we, we see that during one hour. <coughs> and so this is also uh, hyperproduction of images and how uh, the regulating gaze is dealing with uh, uh, this kind of uh, informations may be also one of the, uh, the topics you may deal with. So the floor is yours, not, sorry, 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 sorry too, too early, uh, I forgot something. Besides dealing with uh, uh, the law and the arts, he's a very serious jurist. Urheberrechtsgesetz, ein Kommentar, uh, Urheberrechtswarnungsgesetz und Kunsturhebergesetz, ein wahnsinniger Schinken. Wissen Sie, was das überhaupt heißt, das über Jahre und Jahrzehnte immer zu verfolgen und zu erneuern auf dem neuesten Stand, so dass es in der Beckschen Reihe erscheint und in jedem uh, und zitierfähig in Gerichtsurteilen und Ähnlichem ist? Das ist eine Wahnsinnsarbeit und gleichzeitig at the same time, it's a structuring of the problematic that is extraordinary because the Urheberrechtsgesetz is really, to my understanding at least, in its logic and uh, in its conception, uh, a wonderful piece of uh, legal art, I would say. You, 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 you are certainly more critical. A work about plagiate should be read by you one day. Original und Kopie im rechtlichen Bildregime. Das Recht des Theaters von 2011, The Law of the Theater. And also another book I have with me, Kulturelles Gedächtnis im 21. Jahrhundert, in the context of the importance of images and visual memorizing. So that's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you very much that you have come over to us and the floor is yours now. Fine. Well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gebhardt. Um, of course, I'm impressed that even a very banal title of a legal habilitation does impress, after all, the sociologists. So, uh, usually, 
lawyers seem to be a little bit pushed aside in the area of the humanities. And also I learned something else. Usually you should, you should keep your uh, CV um, as short as possible because the moderators usually, you didn't do it luckily, but usually tend to read it. And uh, all you have done over your lifetime uh, then turns into a very painful reading of one page of minor achievements. Uh, but I have also learned that you, probably one shouldn't write so many books because they come back to you. Anyway, um, what I want to do with you is basically engage on a little journey, a typical work in progress, because the regulation of the gaze, as I called it here, uh, is kind of haunting me for, I must say, almost more than a, a decade now. And uh, the dream is, of course, to one, at one point in time turn it into a book. And uh, Professor Gephardt has already asked me, well, when did you pu can, you, can, can I expect the manuscript? And uh, do you have already a publishing contract? And when I said no, he was relieved, because that means the close to month series might be up for for grabs, which is a, quite an incentive, I must say. Um, in preparing the talk, it turned out, so I started, I mean, my research is in German, basically, for reasons I'll, I'll explain, but because so many of you would have been left out of the discussion if I continue in, in German, I decided to switch to English, and a couple of problems immediately uh, transpired. And that's why the presentation starts with some sort of a prelude, uh, or the famous polygomina, as you might say, the thing before the actual uh, thing. And it starts right on that slide. If you look at it, uh, what you see is text. What you see is text here, and I uh, uh, choose to open my presentation with a comparison between text and a slide, because what you see here translates basically into that. And you can reflect yourself now to what extent the text <coughs> expresses the same thing as the image. And it's basically about that I want to talk to, what I chose as topic for my idea, the question to what extent visual material, visual images are being controlled and regulated by the law. So that's relatively easy. The problem, of course, then arrives, and here we have another problem of translation, or as you said, probably of transfer, maybe of reconstruction, with regard to language. Those are the words which usually we use to describe the field of the visual. It's built, upbuilding, upbuild, builtness, image also appears as a, an English transplant. We have the forebuild in both variants, the forebuild as the role model, but also as a pre-existing image. We have the nachbuild, the after image, whatever that means. And in the English we have picture, image depiction, reproduction, perhaps pre-image, role model, after image. And my wife being British, I asked her about the correspondences, which words I should use. And it turned out that even from two languages as close as German to English, it's very difficult to transpose the exact meanings. The, the, the uh, uh, notions don't just have the same meanings. The same, and in particular, uh, the problem is with Blick, what's relatively easy and clear-cut in German, is not really catchable in, in the ang English. It's a gl glance, you mentioned gaze, you eyes. And therefore, I think before we even start, we do have to kind of agree of some, some, time, uh, some, some kind of uh, uh, terminology in order to make sure, clear, what we are talking about. And I hope I'm being consistent myself uh, that I'm using the same word for the same uh, thing I, I, I mean. Um, what I suggest is, um, and I'll tell you, on the next slide I'll tell you why, is to use the word image only for the immaterial visual form. In a way, the, the ideal of what we see. Um, as opposed to the picture. And I know the term picture is a little ambiguous in the English because it mean, can mean, for example, the photograph, but also it can mean what you see in the photograph. But I, for certain reasons, for the reasons of my comparing the visual to the legal regime, I need to differentiate uh, the two. So therefore, I suggest that we use the picture only for an object 
typically the photograph or the representation of what you see on that map. Not what you see, but the map as such with the fixated and projected image, so to speak. So it's an object depicting, and the picture itself is an object, independent from the object it depicts, which I'd call the object depicted, in the form of an image. So if you are with me till here, then we are fine. And then I choose out of this broad range of view, gaze, look, uh, glance, I choose gaze because I think that the most important aspect is the activity of looking at something. Nothing which happens accidental, although of course the two border, we'll get back to that. Um, and in particular, it's the gaze of looking at something, at a, at a depiction and the object depicted by it. And if you look at the object depicted by a picture, then of course we also look at the image. What we see in the picture is the image of the object depicted. Sounds awfully complicated, but I haven't found any shorter way uh, to uh, basically phrase it. Now to um, show that in a little graph, because I'm a visual type, um, I would try to <laughs> reproduce now my distinctions and it starts with the object depicted and of course you see easily that's only like as you say a crutch a crooker uh, because what you see is not an object depicted it's already a picture <laughs> of an object depicted so in order to show a real object I either can call for you to imagine it but that would already be a picture in your head but it's never possible to, I can show you that bottle, and that bottle here is physically present, but that flower pot obviously isn't. So imagine for a time being that be the real object. Then we take a photograph of it, and what comes out, this little photograph, uh, I would call that the picture, as an object. And in the picture you see the image of the object depicted. Okay, are you with me? And then of course comes the onlooker. He gazes. It was lucky that sometimes he actually gazes at the picture and then he does what? And that's a problem. Because usually um, that's the most you get in, li in literature about the visual. And uh, it's, in my view, it's even more complicated because I've been asking photographers what they actually choose, uh, or, or what, what happens when they press the shutter. Of course, they take a photograph, they take a picture of an object existing, but they choose a particular moment. And the question is, what are the criteria for choosing that particular moment? Now, in picture theory, Cartier-Bresson, the photographer, developed the theory of choosing the right moment, the moment which kind of, by its formal composition, expresses the whole scenery and what's behind. So that's clearly someone who waits in a scenery, he sees something coming and when that actually comes he presses the shutter. Well what does he see? So he kind of pre-sees before things happening, he sees something so there must be some sort of an image in his mind before he actually presses the shutter. And the question I have to photographers is, can you actually t take pictures without having the picture you want to take already in your mind? And I think, I presume, that's probably excluded unless you go for strategy of randomness. And uh, it's a pity uh, Stössel is no longer here. We could ask him, how did you get the picture of the, the, the pictures you took? And I presume that in artistic uh, uh, strategies, it's more or less the same thing. You have something in your mind and when you see it, you know it's right. And as long as you don't see it, if, if what you make, what you produce as a picture is not really corresponding to the pre-image you have in your mind, as long as that's not the case, you don't stop with your artistic activity. You stop at a certain point. You might say that this is much too static, it's much too focused on a, a pictorial object. Uh, never mind, but I think it gives you a direction. The real problem comes, of course, at the other end and that's the so-called after image or what I term the after image what happens in the eye of the beholder beauty is in the eye of the beholder I look at you and say you look beautiful and someone else might say excuse me <laughs> um, choose you a random example <laughs> uh, can go the other way you could say she's ugly and everybody says excuse me <laughs> uh, or you all say excuse me um, and the question of course is and we know that um, the after image depends largely from uh, from uh, cultural uh, from cultural uh, backgrounds, from the preconditions, from the images you have seen. You arrange something new, you see, you arrange it in your 
in your mind, uh, you process it according to different cultures, upbringings. It goes as far that people think certain images are beautiful, whereas other people squarely say they are ugly. Uh, there are different readings of pictures. This is a positive message, this is a negative message. Um, we do have uh, we do have this, and also we know that where the eyes are turning, and I think it's a good reason they turn. You cannot really fix them. We don't know what we see. Remember this debate about the gold, white, and black and blue dress. Did you follow that? There was a picture. There was a picture taken on a wedding somewhere in the Outer Hebrides, and that was put onto the internet, and people didn't think anything about it. And all of a sudden, the discussion arrived: What's the color of that dress? And half the people saw it as a white dress with golden embroidery and the other said, are you nuts? That is a blue dress, night blue and with black stripes. And the question, it seemed to be one of those pictures which kind of jump where you might see the one or the other. The problem is you couldn't even say, describe what you saw because it wasn't sure. Did you only see it? Was it there differently? Was it a question of the mobile phone you had? Whether you had a Samsung or, or an iP uh, iPhone, well, that made the difference. Whether it was your cultural background, whether it was maybe a, an age or a gender differentiation of your actual perceptors or your brain. Was it cultural upbringing? Um, my father said he didn't see a dress at all, what I, what I was talking about. Uh, so things are getting difficult. And of course it gets more complicated. Um, I choose a sequential order. And I choose it because I have this model that there is a pre-image, then there is an object, and you try to make a picture of that object, then this is being looked at or gazed at, and then it's processed in your head. You could try for yourself how you bring this image, this linear image, together with the semiotic triangle. Where is the symbol and where is the object? Well, the object's probably here. That might be the sign with it and probably the after image is the, the third one in the row. But we might, of course, easily have a triangle here. That's an area which I think has to still be uh, ex, uh, exploited and I have to, to give, give it some more time to get into this. So this was my prolegomen and my prelude and uh, that's what I actually, where this talk starts. A um, uh, little introduction why I choose that, that topic and none other. Then a little bit about the layout of the book. I added that here in part one or number two in order to get some hopefully helpful feedback from you. Uh, where I should go, where I should look, uh, etc. And then I take out one of the particular points out of the book, uh, a chapter which is on commands. Because if you talk about picture rules, everybody thinks, oh, that's about prohibitions. We prohibit uh, child pornography, we prohibit and regulate the dissemination of violent pictures, we are fighting uh, mobbing on the internet, but I think it's much more fun to look at the non-obvious end and just look at uh, what about picture commands. The, uh, uh, where the uh, normative uh, impulse is not not to look, but the command do look, instead of do not look. And then ultimately some conclusions which are probably valid for, uh, for both uh, of them. So if we start with the motivation uh, and introduction, um, when I started the project and I said, uh, told you I was working now on it for, for more than a decade, it was basically an abstract idea by saying if after the iconic turn images become ever more important and play a greater role in communication, substituting verbal and text communication, um, then why is it that so little is written about the rules governing that sort of communication? We have a law as literature movement, but we do not have a law and images movement. So there seems to be uh, an obvious uh, gap. Of course, later on, uh, the issue of globalization uh, came to it, uh, which I just uh, uh, described here by diverging understandings of what pictures are what they should do, and of course what the onlooker expects from pictures. And uh, if then I go on that uh, in Western philosophy from Plato to Derrida, we have uh, problems with pictures because pictures are said supposed to lie uh, and they are considered as dangerous in the way they lie. Um, they might uh, be uh, under complex yet powerful 
uh, but they had the potential to insult and violate. I mean, with Charlie Hebdo, uh, this has uh, taken yet another turn. All of a sudden, pictures and the fabrication of pictures can give rise to death in real life. And that is, of course, uh, something, something new. The last point here, that's the one which is, is, uh, is uh, vexing, vexing people. Um, it's not only Plato, uh, it's also modern philosophies where, uh, Mitchell said that once, where the constructivists, they use text somehow in order to, by way of critique and <coughs> deliberation, ban this magic power of images. So once you have explained how pictures work, it's somehow believed, or you are relieved, that the pictures somehow lose their sudden magic spell. And that's an interesting uh, overlap of text and, and image, which, which lies behind. Um, but of course, the uh, magic is, is a very imprecise word. And uh, so if you go through the, uh, uh, the, the theoretical writing, uh, you find that the magic that lies in pictures, because you stare at pictures, has been uh, transformed. And the latest thinking <coughs> that started with, with Elkin, who says the object stares back. So something in the picture looks at you. And uh, Mitchell and, and Bredekamp, they go as far as by saying, well, it's not us looking at pictures, but it's rather pictures looking at us. <coughs> Sounds a little strange, because it might in the end go as far as saying pictures have a life of their own. <laughs> Uh, but if you think about it, we have also the notion that a certain picture attracts our attention. So here clearly the active part is the picture, it's not us. And if you think about psychological references, the way we are anthropologically trained by <coughs> reacting to variations in our field of vision, because that might be the potential <coughs> death of tiger jumping up, left or right, uh, then, of course, uh, there might be something to it that it's the pictures having their own life. A line that could be pursued if we are looking to the deontic power uh, of pictures and to figure out uh, to what extent really pictures can have a normative uh, effect. Now, if pictures are really as dangerous or have the potential to violate, then a natural role, at least from a lawyer's perspective, might be, well, then we should kind of try to ban that magic spell. We should control it, at least, and we should enforce anything which kind of let slip that magic power um, um, away. And, uh, um, and uh, the problem is, if then, uh, you look into your textbooks, of course there are lots of picture bans. You shall not make pictures of, uh, of military, uh, uh, military installations. You shall not uh, use uh, symbols of, uh, uh, of uh, dictatorial uh, and anti-democratic associations, for example. You shall not uh, disseminate hardcore pornography. You shall not even make or possess child pornography. Uh, but in literature, there is little which connects the two areas. Um, the uh, visual image images and the studies in visual images, they have uh, uh, made real progress in the last 30, 40 years. Until the late 70s, uh, the history of photography, for example, was only written as a history of the development of photographic equipment. Then it was written uh, according to the history of great male white photographers, with an eventual addition of a couple of women who also took the camera up. Uh, and uh, since the 70s, especially with the cultural turn in the humanities, uh, all different sorts of images have been, uh, of, of, of uh, qualities of images have been discussed. But interestingly enough, you do not find the connection to law. Even in Friedberg's uh, The Power of Images, his seminal work, he talks about a little bit about iconoclasm, he talks about censorship, but if you look in the index, in the end, the word law doesn't appear. If you read uh, Barth's uh, uh, Camera Lucida, he uh, tra comes to the point where he says, well, we have to somehow control the effect of images, and he only suggests two ways out. The one is to regard images as art, kind of narrow them down to the artistic area, or to kind of increase their number, to proliferate the images, so that the effect of each single uh, image is, is watered down. But yet again, the idea 
and he was a sociologist, uh, that uh, regulation could be done by law uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't appear uh, to him. And that's of course something which is a strange uh, thing for, for lawyers, but it's a problem we are often forced with. I once had a book in my hand, it, it said, The History of Marriage in the Western World, basically from Roman times to today. And the word law and legal regulation didn't appear. Now, as a lawyer, you ask yourself, how the heck can you write the history of the family without even mentioning the fact that the steering aspect of it, the controlling aspect of it, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, uh, done by at least law as a tool. But to have law completely absent, that's something which is beyond my, uh, uh, my grasp. There are certain reasons for that, we'll not go, go into it. Now that's the idea uh, of the starting point now and of course then I immediately run into certain problems. The area is of course so wide that I have to do some limitations. The first one is a crucial one. I only focus on still images. Um, and why do I do that? Because the film has after all a different quality. Uh, it's one of those examples, uh, Victor Meyer Schoenberger, the guy from uh, the Oxford Internet Institute recently had a talk he gave here in Bonn, uh, explained it very adamantly by saying, if you have one picture, you have one picture. If you have two pictures, you have two pictures. If you have 16 pictures taken from the same standpoint in a row, and you look at them successively within a second, all of a sudden the thing flips and the whole thing starts moving. So it's something totally different. Quantity kind of changes into quality and because of that we have a total different legal um, areas of law uh, regulating film from supporting films to uh, the censorship issue of, of film is different from the still image so therefore I said for practical reason I limit myself to still. And there's a second point why I go for still images only but that is something I'd like to hear your opinion on uh, I have the thesis that um, when you remember movies, you hardly ever remember the movies moving. At least when I remember a movie, I remember stills, single individual scenes from a movie. I don't see two people going to each other, embracing themselves, or someone blowing up with everything. I just see the blown up or the kiss or whatever. Uh, but that's subject, of course, uh, to debate. Um, what's more interesting is I uh, started it as a project on photography and I think one has to concentrate on photography and I think that still makes sense because most of the images today are still photographs. However, with the advent of the digital, we have to enlarge the field into the future a little bit. Any sort of visualization, even visualization of data that resemble pictures, I think we should take them into consideration otherwise we'd be stuck in history. And of course, legal regulation cannot be understood without going back to real images, the famous 200 you mentioned people saw, because the uh, biblical uh, command, thou shalt not pictures of God or anything that moveth on earth, uh, would not be, uh, uh, I mean, if you cut that out, then the whole history of, of regulating images uh, kind of hangs into, uh, in, in, in the air. And now come the more serious. I think these two uh, constraints, they can be lived with. Uh, the other ones are more problematic. Law is a national affair. We don't have an international convention on regulating pictures, except for some uh, minor details. So if you talk about regulation, you have to start with national law, or you would have to make a full-fledged comparative law analysis, or draw the sum out of all 200 national laws, and that is simply impossible. So therefore national law, which of course seriously limits the readership, and the question is does an English book based on German law make sense, so therefore I decided to write in German, which means that no English reader will ever read it, which is a little troubling. Same thing, do you focus only on the current and to what extent do you go historical? Um, that is also a problem that uh, has to has serious, uh, serious limitations, and uh, maybe you could give me an idea how to overcome them. Um, a little uh, explanation on the layout of the book. It should, of course, not be a how-to book uh, to uh, photographers. Uh, there are a couple of them. Uh, rather, I'll try to match the two different areas of, of research, the visual images and visual culture. Um, uh, uh, um, 
the uh, results uh, together with uh, the normative uh, roles. Um, of course, I say a little bit of sociology and history. Uh, it's really difficult to get all three disciplines uh, together. In doing so, I then would like to come back to my differentiation. Remember the one on the slide before? Object, <coughs> pic picture, image, because I think you can easily see to what extent it has repercussions on understanding pictures and how pictures are being dealt with. The first example I want to cite you is the anthropologist's wife. Maybe you can tell me which anthropologist it was. Was it Levi Strauss or someone else? travels to the South Sea and discusses with the chieftain of the local tribe uh, about uh, their respective wives. And uh, since the wife of the anthropologist uh, uh, was staying at home, uh, he nevertheless wanted to show what his wife was like and he pulls out the famous picture of his wife out of his wallet, hands it over to the chief and says, this is my wife. <laughs> Silence at the other end. The chief looks at it, turns it round, hands it back and says, that's your wife. Uh, he says, yeah, that's my wife. And the chieftain, of course, says, well, with all due respect, but your wife seems to be rather black and white and also very flat and lightweight. Um, second, um, the history of iconoclasm can, of course, be explained by the differentiation between object depicted picture image because as you may know the problem was what happens if you dance around the golden calf represented here in that famous painting by uh, Poussin um, and the, 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 the problem is in, in dancing or let's put it take the, the uh, Byzantine example of Jesus of Christ depicted in an icon um, what, what do you do if you stand in front of that picture? And the people who have argued against the use of pictures have always said, basically, have basically equated the picture with the real thing by saying, if you pray in front of a painting depicting Christ, then you are venerating that particular, worshipping, sorry, you're worshipping that particular picture. And the opposing view, which finally uh, uh, made it, at least in the Catholic tradition, made it uh, uh, to, the, to the fore, was that when you look at a picture, you look basically through the picture. You look through the picture at something. Christ is the image you look at. Christ is the only one that could be worshipped. And if you pray in front of the image, and if you venerate the image, you are not doing anything which is considered improper. And because of that differentiation, that was the base, it was decided at a council, again a legal resolution uh, in Itzea in 70, 787, and it was reaffirmed in Trient at 1563, where another aspect was added, and that's the pedagogical aspect, by saying, hey, if we have illiterate people, then showing something what it's about is something which uh, is, uh, is helping us in order to convey the message uh, of God. Now the vexing problem, and here I don't have an answer, is, is this distinction between object depicted picture and image, is it an anthropological issue, so does that keep valid for everybody, for all humankind, or is this view of differentiating culturally influenced? Uh, Otto Karlschreuer was so nice, uh, so kind to make me available an article written by, by Bredekamp, who postulates that the attack on the Mohammed um, uh, depictions as well as the uh, uh, tearing down and bombing of the demolition of all religious symbols, mosques, etc. of the, the other main, uh, basically of the Shiite mosques by the Islamic uh, terrorists um, it has to do with the fact that they do not differentiate between the object and the object and the depiction of the object thereby destroying the picture and thinking that by destroying the picture the object depicted is going away or arguing the other way around that the picture does something which the picture shouldn't do namely depicting uh, the, uh, uh, the object. Um, and the question is um, is it a cultural bias if we kind of explain what happens in this radical Islamic view uh, if we explain it in this way uh, is that culturally biased or, or isn't it? Uh, 
On the legal side, if we look at what the law has to say, it becomes a little easier. Um, of course, uh, it's statutory norms, but I don't want to go only to statutory norms. We have to also look at social practices, which pictures are being looked at, which are considered as being indecent. And that, of course, brings us to the problem of self-regulation. There are a lot of press codices out there, which are rather vaguely formulated. But if we look where is the cutting edge of the pictures we can look at today, and we do not, we are not supposed to look at, where is the decision taken? It's no longer taken by the legislator. And in the clearly the, the difficult cases, it's not always taken by the judges, but it's basically the uh, the journalists uh, responsible for uh, uh, deciding which pictures should be seen or should not be seen. Uh, two latest example: the one is pretty sure that there exists a picture of Princess Diana sh shortly a couple of minutes or seconds before her death. Uh, I've been once in the presence of that photographer, and he wanted to know whether publishing it might uh, might create uh, uh, punish uh, not uh, criminal law uh, sanctions. I mean, take criminal law sanctions in Germany. Um, and they are in an interview with the editor in in chief uh, of the uh, of the Sun in, in England, who said the pictures were offered to me, uh, but uh, I refused to show them. Apparently, they have been published once in the United States. And uh, there was recently a picture exhibition about paparazzi photographs in Frankfurt, and I think in that catalogue they have a reproduction, interestingly enough, not of the picture, but of the newspaper which depicts the picture. <laughs> so here you have a cascade of objects, object depicted, and in that form of mediation by keeping another layer in between, the image was showable in very small form of black and white probably you needed a magnifying lens to see what was going on basically you had to believe the text that this was the picture but in this respect you could you could show it and uh, the question is of course the decapitation videos uh, uh, of the is which our tv has always refused one channel in the united states showed it big debate starting thereafter <coughs> there is lots of writing about and the main claim is that it's the repetition of these pictures like Enrico Terone said, which kind of creates some normative effect and which also creates some watering down effect, which kind of turns what was a newsworthy event into something very shallow for entertainment or for reassurement, uh, which should probably be controlled. And here we see that the law uh, really comes to an end in really controlling this field of uh, visual um, imagery. Um, Second point, and I uh, uh, already uh, indicated that, there are two normative uh, uh, impulses. The one is do not make, do not show, do not look. That's the question of the prohibitions. And then, of course, you have the commands, do make, do show, do look. Again, with the translation problem, I'm not sure whether command is the proper word. Morak might perhaps say about it. Command, what word is it? It's the ten. Commandments, isn't it? Yeah. Ten Commandments, which is interesting enough, most of them are prohibitions. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not steal. That's not a commandment, that's a prohibition, it's a ban, basically. So the word doesn't help in order to, uh, for that distinction I want to, I want to make. Uh, and of course we have uh, influencing technology with digital, uh, the whole uh, regulation of pictures becomes a different issue. And of course the sociological uh, uses uh, being made um, are, are influencing a part. What I want to point out is that there are certain restrictions, certain areas where law has a, a, has a problem with as a tool. The first one is what I call the head of the spectator. Uh, remember, after the uh, gaze was looking at the picture, we don't know. We, we only can reproduce what the retina of our eye sees, but from then on we are completely left in the dark. All we can see is like blood flowing in our area or some electrical activity in our nerves, but what kind of image that transposes, we have absolutely no idea. And if we take to, uh, into consideration the different cultural backgrounds, etc., etc., into which such an image blends, uh, we are left uh, at random and nobody in law can force me to see, uh, uh, to see what the lawmaker wants to see in front of a particular picture. That is up, uh, up to me. So although the central perspective kind of orders the viewer at a particular point in space, because once you see a picture in central perspective and you look at it, you're immediately placed at that particular point 
viewpoint from the original uh, draftsperson here. It's the famous uh, Dürer uh, engraving. Um, uh, there uh, still is the imprecision of perception, cultural, psychological, uh, and the predisposition. And that's an area which is very difficult for the law to reach. So law by definition, that's one of my, my points I want to make, is they have to attach to the making of images, they have to kind of attack the showing of images, and eventually they can physically prevent people from looking at it. But it's very difficult for law to enter that second sphere, which we thought now or have discovered is the more, more important one, and certainly the more interesting one. And another one is uh, 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 the question of how does re law relate to other sociological subsystems. Now, um, the thing is that especially uh, lawyers who are trained in the Roman law um, environment, they think or tend to believe that any particular constellation is kind of predefined under the legal rules. When we apply the law to a given set of facts, we have to find the answer. The answer is supposedly to already be is already in the rules, and it's only it has to be distilled out of the rules. And that gives rise to the idea, if you talk to law students, they tend to believe that, that everything in life is, is regulated by law. The chairs you sit on, well, the lawyers say, well, it's easy, that's a rental contract. Um, the fact that we have a uh, that we have a, uh, a, a colleague here has to do with the uh, law of subsidies, has to do with state organization, etc., etc., freedom of academics, etc. So everything is pretty fine. But if you look at the different uh, sociological subsystems, and forgive me if I haven't uh, have left out religion and some others, uh, but only between law, technology, market, and social norms then of course it becomes clear that the law doesn't even influence, I mean in this respect as you will see, influences only half of the relationships that are possible. Let's take the idea of the selfies because that explains to you why, how did it all start? Well it started basically with a legal or political decision to open up certain frequencies so that you could get away from smartphones to, uh, to, 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 to telephones to get to mobile phones and they could work on frequency frequencies which were before that covered and reserved for military and uh, what other technological uses. So technology then developed and said why not add to the telephone uh, when we can transmit so many data, why not add a camera? And uh, they developed um, a market model, and the law could influence upon the market, but uh, in the question of whether these norms, these telephones were sold or not, the law didn't have anything to do. Law can reach social norms, but it certainly cannot reach the other interactions, namely the question that technology could market phones so that they were, were being sold in great quantities and that these people instead of photographing someone else started photographing themselves that's something the law didn't have a major say that was only a happening in this triangle here and there the law didn't regulate anything a law only starts intervening if something happens with social norms if uh, the students in class send around the naked pictures of the exes or whatever then the law starts regulating and cutting a little bit away here. So in a way you could say half of the cake is not even touched by law uh, and with that being reserved, I mean with that reservation being made we have to then approach the, the legal rules. And uh, just to give you a, a quick uh, view what the book should look like, it should basically lay the groundwork, explain to the lawyers what picture science says and explain to the non-lawyers what the law wants to do. Uh, and that includes, uh, includes of course, a, a reflection on the difference between law and text, which plays le uh, a role on, on many levels. And then I want to go to the field of normative uh, picture rules, uh, not gathered according to the logic of the law, copyright, patent law, prohibition uh, of minors, etc., but more in these general notions such as appropriation of reality, what can be appropriated in reality, uh, what about the proof and surveillance aspect? What about the construction of images, the construction of the image of women and of men in society, uh, etc.? And the third part, of course, then has to, did, to do with digitization. And here, just a quick word, my theory will be that um, more quickly than we think, the traditional notion of the picture as depicting something really will disappear. Not because we can easily use Photoshop and make retouches. 
because whether I retouch something or not, it's still the object visible. But my theory is that, first of all, pictures are more and more being taken by machines automatically and in order not to be looked at by humans anymore, but just by machines. The prime example is your passport photograph. Did you ever wonder why you look so strange on your passport photographs? Mm -hmm. And if you show it to your neighbors, they say, well, that's not you. But that misses the point. The photograph on your passport is not supposed to be recognized by the people who know you or by yourself. It's supposed to be recognized by a machine. The machine making a comparison between that photograph and your outer appearance. And now you could ask yourself according to what parameter. And there we probably come to one of these pre-images. In this case, I think it's a, um, it's a parameterization of five different factors. It's the distance of your eyes, it's the difference between your, uh, your top and your nose tip to the, to the chin and I think the width of your cheekbones. I think that's all they need and these parameters taken together classify the individual pictures. That's the direction where we will be going in terms of recognizing leaves the human somewhere out. And the further we go, if we end up in big data, pictures and images, well, not maybe images, but some sort of visualizations will be created out of abstract data. And then the question is, how far have we moved away from this definition and how are we going to regulate? Data protection, for example, totally misses the point. Data protection as a regulative tool to come to terms with machines and the humanity, the, the human aspect of the individual, rests, rests on three different pillars. The one is uh, only create those data which are absolutely necessary, then only use them by with consent of the person the data have been taken from, and third, only for a limited purpose. Now, big data exactly works the other way around. It works on the exact opposite of all three assumptions. It works on take as many data as you can, don't ask for consent, and use it for any purpose you want. Now, how do we bring this together? And that will be then, of course, the kind of the ending point of uh, the projection forward of what law and the image uh, can do. And uh, it's easy to see that the image as we know it might disappear. That's some of the theories I a little bit owe to Belting because Belting's famous book says the law, uh, not the uh, law, uh, the picture, the image after, before the invention of art and that means there might also be an after invention of the arts so there will be a time after the arts and then the question is what happens to the to the image so that's the transformation against the technological uh, background. And of course the issue of globalization plays an increasing role. Ten years ago it was not so much important to differentiate between different picture expectancies because we were probably assuming that everybody liked the Coke advertisement and was going for Western type uh, image uh, material. But as it turns out that is an assumption which is a little bit too uh, premature. Now let me come to part three and that is just some thoughts uh, on because that's much more fun because it's much more hands-on lots of pictures uh, on the on the commands uh, in a way a command is the mirror image to a, a prohibition um, it says do look at pictures do make pictures or, or do present uh, uh, pictures interestingly enough both the prohibition the ban and the command rely on the force of pictures. In the one case the force of pictures is feared and it's feared because it's dangerous and therefore we have to ban it and here there is a magic power being hoped for. By looking at an image you should be enlightened, you should be informed, you should be embedded <coughs> or whatsoever. So it's the exact, uh, in a way, the uh, exact uh, um, opposite. Uh, the problem of course here resides in the uh, enforcement problem. How can you uh, force someone to look at something? You can force someone to produce an image, you can force someone to look at an image, and, um, but it's difficult to kind of have someone really look at something. Notable exception, traffic signs. In traffic signs there exists a the legal rule which says if you participate in traffic you have to look at the traffic signs. Interestingly enough, the traffic signs themselves are a very strange mixture. That's like a 
Well, it's, it's a command. Look at the picture. But the picture itself doesn't command anything. It just informs you and it warns you. You know, all these warning signs at this form. This is a clear prohibition. Do not enter. So your attention is drawn. You're supposed to. You're commanded to look at a prohibition. And this is a mixed sign because it says you may drive this way and that, but it also contains, of course, the negative, the implication, you are not supposed to go left. Um, so again, some sort of, of layer, and it shows you how complicated all this picture material uh, is. And because we do have this problem of a difficulty of enforcing the gaze, uh, I have to kind of design, <laughs> use a design trick by saying I have to have a broader notion of what a picture command is. And I have to include all those presentations which come with some sort of normative impetus, even if it's not a real legislative impetus or legislative prescription, such as the one look at traffic signs. And my idea is that uh, because of that power of images and our attention we give to images, and therefore it's fair enough to speak of picture commands whenever someone presents a picture to you in the intention of you having to look at it. And that is something whenever visual material is introduced in your visual field, field of vision, so that your attention is grabbed even if only by reflex. Um, and that's the, uh, the point, that's why I'm saying I'm having a, a, broader, a broader notion uh, a poster in a public space, a picture in a museum, has some normative impetus in this respect. Uh, that's how I designed the, the notion of, of command. And if that is of course the case, then we come to some side issues which have to do uh, with the commands which kind of soften the, the, the commands or take them away. The first one is the so-called warnings. Remember, you have all sorts of, of warnings uh, which say, okay, the attention, reflective attention might draw your attention to that picture, but be warned, it might not be suitable for you. And legally speaking, they come in different forms. This is probably uh, a voluntary thing. That is a, uh, an official stamp by one of the authorities who rate uh, pictures. And that has also a legal implication you, can you can you see what it is? It's a sex shop, Beate Use. And where is the where is the softening <laughs> effect? Well, it's that curtain, which in the law it says the area of X-rated material behind the curtain and before should be separated so that they are not visible and they cannot be seen by minors. Now the curtain here developed into something very see-through and thin and the lawyers are now of course called to speculate uh, uh, how much space in between the different stripes and strings could be so that you could still speak of a vision blending device. Um, but basically it's the, same, it's the same idea. We have a separation. We don't, we don't, uh, uh, don't allow uh, everybody in but we kind of separate. It works like a, it works like a filter. Um, another point I found out is that you could explain the iconoclastic gesture in connection with picture commands. Usually if you speak about iconoclasm, it's about the destruction of works of art. It's basically like discussed in the area of prohibition. You do not want other people to see something. And if you look at it, the toppling of statutes, by toppling here, this is the famous uh, taking down of the uh, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, statute in uh, in uh, Iraq, in Baghdad, um, it's not only the uh, traditional explanation that uh, visibly the old state form, the old ruler is taken away, is demolished, is moved out of pictures' eyes, but I think it also removes, if you, let's put it the other way around, if you work on the assumption that the statute stands there in order to be looked at, then removing the statute annihilates the command to look at that particular statute. And that's, I think, uh, I'm glad you're not, <laughs> uh, that uh, that's a point uh, which I think is uh, somewhat overlooked and not really stressed and emphasized in the debate on, on iconoclasm. Uh, which brings us to a different uh, point, what happens uh, thereafter? I mean, the statute is torn down, 
and of course the raising the flag is the, the similar thing and here the old flag it's the, has, has been torn down and the new flag is raised. This is the famous uh, iconographic uh, issue of a picture of Imohima, uh, that island in the Pacific which was uh, hardly fought, uh, heavily fought over. Uh, more than uh, uh, three-fourths of the uh, US soldiers died. Finally they uh, uh, got the island and that was the end then Actually, it had several outcomes. It was the end of the uh, it was the defeat of the Japanese, but because there were so heavy casualties, uh, it incited the Americans to decide not to invade Japan uh, on the territory, on the soil, but to rather use the atomic bomb as the next, uh, which again then brought us 60 years of peace, etc., etc. But what's interesting here is that there was the old flag. I mean, not standing exactly at the same place. Uh, but it's raising a new flag. So there's something has been taken down, but something similar has been erected. So here the clear impetus is now look at this American flag. Look at the Stars and Stripes banner. And this has been reinforced, as you all know, because this image has been turned into a sculpture. And that sculpture stands where? In front of Arlington Cemetery at a place when you approach it and drive up the avenue you really you physically have to look up so what else could there be uh, what other could there be than a uh, than a picture command now interestingly enough what happens if you're living in a democracy and there's a fabulous article I think in the Wanke compendium on uh, on the political iconography and uh, someone was looking after what happened in Eastern Germany once all the Marxists and Lenins were brought down. Were they replaced by something else? Nope. There is a blank space. And why is there a blank space? Visual image people declare that democracy has not developed a type of symbol to be looked at. So there is no command, hey, we are a democracy, look at this apart from the French Revolution with that lady on the barricades with the half-naked breast or whatever. Uh, but that quickly disappeared because as a long-lasting tradition that wasn't very, uh, wasn't very uh, convincing. Um, of course you have the artistic sister to taking the commands away, uh, creative destruction, I'm not going into this here. Uh, it's rare cases though where artists specifically took an artwork by someone else and physically destroyed that artwork in order to no longer have to look at it. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the best is the verbatim quotation by someone saying, God heavens, finally Picasso is dead. So this overfather is no longer standing in, in our way. We don't have to refer to him any longer. Uh, we can now go on with our own uh, uh, imagery. Um, Commands to look at pictures. A little bit of history. I mean, it started with coins and public statutes. This is actually a coin of uh, the Emperor Augustus 2,000 years ago. And the uh, idea is, of course, why, why have these coins? Well, of course, the one thing is, um, in times of limited travel, uh, Augustus had to be visually present in the distances of his empire. There's a 50% chance of looking at him. Uh, depending on which side of the coin you look. If you have several, the uh, probability to look at it increases. Um, and I don't have to dwell because it's already quarter past, uh, more on the iconography <coughs> of that. Um, the uh, statutes, here the famous uh, Aurelian uh, statute uh, in, in Rome, um, happened thereafter, representative of the ruler. And the interesting thing is that this kind of representation disappeared for a period of more than a thousand years. In the medieval ages, you do not have freestanding equestrian statues. It was only uh, uh, Ludwig the, uh, uh, the 14th who on the Place Vendôme, on the uh, column, on top of the column, erected that freestanding monument to reintroduce in the absolute state uh, his presence by saying, hey, I'm standing in the middle, look at me. I'm at the center of the universe, no? and look at me. And uh, this is a resurgence of the symbol and of the of the the command. That's how I interpret it: of the command to look at the emperor. And the question, of course, is interesting one: what happened with this command in today's times? And again, sorry, we have to go to national uh, things. Those are, you remember, the two mark, two, two German mark uh, coins. However, there's a mark difference. By the time these coins were made. All these politicians, Adenauer, Heuss, Schumacher, Erhard, Strauss, and Willy Brandt, 
had already died. So that's something completely different. That's not the Augustus coin. That's a commemorative medal, basically. So that's something completely different. So if we have to look to a survival of the image of the emperor, we have to go maybe to stamps. And that's the German order of stamps. Uh, interestingly, iconographically, you see there is no clear incision here, the hour zero where everything started anew. Iconographically, that doesn't show very much, does it? I mean, Hitler is presented in much the same way as even Heinemann. Interestingly enough, it stopped with Heinemann as a president. Heinemann, being a very rigid Protestant from background, was not happy with the stamp. As the anecdote goes, the stamps had already been printed and they couldn't be put back from the market, so they were used up. Scheel, as the next president, said, I don't want my figure, I'm too young to be on stamps. So that was the end of that, uh, that, was the end of that uh, tradition, um, in a way. Um, interestingly enough, our presidents in Germany, we put them on stamps, whereas the chancellors, they always got an oil painting. Don't know what that means, but it is... Maybe it's just the fourth of tradition. Um, command to look at pictures. It all shifted then to real life portraits. The prime example in France is of course Mitterrand, who very carefully, like all other presidents, choose not only a setting, but it's a whole iconographic story being told. This is the homme de lettre, the guy who sits, the president, who is not like Sarkozy, the clown around, or... Uh, Toscan uh, spending his life with beautiful ladies, but this is the guy who reads a book, and I think the book less. is carefully more or less. Well, that's what he pretends. It's an image. Uh, uh, talking about the real guy who had uh, a secret family and uh, was has ordered some killings, etc. You don't uh, do this. Um, so that's the, the the setting, and we'll get back to what it looks in Germany. Make a little de detour to East Germany. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, would you? <laughs> And these people thought that by having these official portraits and having the command to hang them in each official office, that <coughs> this could save the state. Well, how does it look in Germany, in West Germany? Um, there's an interesting mixture between the personality of the president and the changing times. And I think it's impossible to sort the two out. Um, I, left, I left away Johannes Raus. Johannes Raus was president of the late 80s till the early 2000s. And he also came from a Protestant uh, background. And he did not have an official image of his on the German website. Interestingly enough, on the Austrian website of the uh, presidency, you found an image of his, but not in Germany. Never figured out why that was the case. Um, Horst Köhler presents himself totally different. He was a manager. He came from the International Monetary Fund. And this is like the manager, the guy in action. Isn't it interesting? The next in the row was uh, Wolf, a more conservative, a little, well, not so spectacular guy. Uh, if you read the lines, but he was kind of very carefully orienting himself towards the fan and celebrity culture. So for example, here you could o uh, order some autographed photographs of his. Mm -hmm. That's the fan postcards. Um, but the real point I want to make is this one. Compare mm -hmm. what we saw here, compare it to this one. Especially if you see Liebe Leser, Dear Reader, Dear Reader. I mean, both, uh, and if you read that, it says, welcome on the internet homepage of the uh, president. Uh, here you can be get informed about dates, uh, uh, travels, and speeches. Um, have a look at the, uh, the seats of, uh, of office, Schloss Bellevue and Villa Hammerschmidt. Uh, you get more information, uh, and uh, uh, please uh, uh, enjoy, enjoy reading. And then if you go, I think if we go back a little bit, um, see this one? It says service. So all of a sudden, from that picture command, hey, I'm the head of state, I'm the center of the world, you have to look at me. It turns the presentation, by very subtle means, turns into an offer to communicate. That's all we can do now, an offer to communicate, which is, of course, in the line of social uh, media, uh, try to grab attention, to catch attention, retain people, draw them into, and on the other hand, it's of course something this chap personally was ever used to do because he was a priest before. He was preaching to the community. He was establishing contact by way of communication. And once we have that, the next slide is really 
shocking and it's meant to be shocking for two reasons I mean, not for the pictures themselves which are absolutely ghastly but they're meant to be ghastly but because it means a return of the command do have a look at it smokers should look at the little baby suffering because of the consequences of the mother smoking nicotine of people having their teeth falling out, of limbs cut being cut off, of people in a wheelchair, of getting a heart attack and of finally getting black lungs. You should have a look at it. Does that really uh, make it? And it's surprising that we get back to these picture commands. Interesting. Um, just to speed up a little bit, uh, finally, a commands in the form of the state. Um, I'm not particularly happy with the selection of the pictures here because <laughs> The Mao is, is not a good example because it has a total different iconography, it has a total different function, but assume here it could be Ben Ali or it could be Hussein, uh, the big poster of the dictator at the street, the political guy, head of government, and compare it to what we had in Germany uh, here, uh, Cole's picture with the Knipst Birner aus, Birner one must say the, the, pe the pear, the pear uh, was the, because of the shape of his head, uh, they called him the pear and uh, the pear is also the light bulb and uh, uh, switch the light bulb off uh, was the, the pun intended here but what happens is that we have very limited advertising of political parties although technically political parties could advertise all over yet the question when political parties can advertise it's interesting enough it's left to each community to local communities they can decide that reminds me a little bit of Ramstedt's uh, communication where it said there are rules they are basically similar but they vary from community to uh, community and it as has played out that there's a strict time frame in which political parties can advertise before and after the election mostly before and the democratic view of course is that uh, there has to be absolute equality in hanging your picture so the community that cannot, the local community cannot say you are a right wing or a minority party, therefore go to the edge of town and we reserve the center of town for the major political parties. Now that would not be allowed. Whereas here there is an absolute monopoly of hanging the pictures. The party decides, the dictatorial party decides which picture people uh, should see, whereas this has been somehow regulated and diversified. So that the actual comparison should not be this one, but I think iconographically and even from their function, these two pictures should be placed next to each other. The political message that this is an economy and a state which is dominated by dictatorial government and this is a state which is dominated by capitalism. Interestingly enough, here again, well, there is some sort of equality as long as that poster on the scaffold reaches into public ground, you need a special permission and that permission has to be granted on a, uh, a perspective uh, on the ground of uh, equal, equal access. However, once you are behind it's basically only a question of money who can finance the bigger poster and that shows a clear message and we are definitely supposed to look at this iPhone so that is in my view, my view uh, a clear example of a, a picture command which finally ends uh, brings me to an end with a remark on who can have an influence on dominating the visual images of the public places we have an unequal treatment. It's the owners of the buildings or those who can place their images onto the buildings. Whoever, as a graffiti artist, as someone also living in the public space, try to project his or her own imagery onto the facade, then we pursue him with criminal sanctions and put him to jail or make him pay a heavy fine. So there is some Im imbalance, which means that property, physical property, uh, and money is much more protected than the freedom to act in the visual area. Now that brings me then to some uh, conclusions uh, roughly sketched here that of course has to be elaborated. Um, the first one is that law is a relatively weak tool because it just doesn't get the important part of what happens in our heads. Um, prohibitions might probably be stronger than commands in the fact that they can kind of keep images away out of the view whereas the others are much more difficult uh, to control 
Um, we have um, in the description, of course, the problem that we have also to take into consideration a dynamic development and we see lots of them, contrary to the common belief that we get more liberal with regard to pornography, uh, feminism, child protection, etc. has led us to reduce what we used to project and see. Um, there's only on the uh, cultural differences, there's only one area I think where in fundamentally we agree on a worldwide basis and that is the imagery of child pornography. There is a worldwide convention against the use and making a distribution of child pornography but any further than that we do not, we do not get and the problem of course which interests uh, uh, our, uh, our college of course here is the question with the cultural shifts are we talking, are we moving towards convergences of these rules or maybe it's just the convergence of the rules creating the real problems as we see perhaps in the Mohammed uh, uh, issues. Um, the problem when it comes to that part where we cannot really look into our, our head, the question is if we leave a little bit the humanities and go back to hard sciences and try to connect these two, should we go to empirical evidence, should we look more eye-tracking decisions? Should we look to use Google Glasses and get this information in order to learn better how we understand pictures, knowing that of course all this knowledge <coughs> can again be used to monopolize us. And there are differences. Someone who recently I was talking was in a seminar about robotics uh, and the issue was whether you could transplant robots that had been developed in Western Europe, <coughs> whether you could transplant them to the Arabian, <coughs> to a Muslim environment, and to the, to Japan. Uh, didn't uh, the answer was you couldn't? There is a certain problem, and it has simply to do with the fact that the reading direction is not the one from left to right. It's from right to left in the Arab, and it's from right to left and upside down, and that has some repercussions on how we handle and interact with robots, for example, and if there are such differences on the fundamental level, you could imagine how big the differences are uh, with regard to psychological perceptions, uh, etc. Unless, that would be my guess, unless we use that empirical evidence and go for it, which is clearly beyond, for example, the possibilities of this uh, college, uh, I think all we can end up is something, which of course is a borrowed phrase, some, some thick description of visual images and the law, and that was about it. Thank you for your prolonged attention.